Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. For those of you who would like to ask questions of our speaker and moderator, there's a Q&A prompt at the very bottom of your screen. Hello. Just click on that and type in your question. For those of you who have helped us by contributing to our annual giving campaign, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. And if you haven't contributed and you're enjoying our quality programs, please consider uh, helping us make this all possible. You can go to our website at lawacth.org and make a contribution today. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, The Politics of Military Operations from Korea to Ukraine, with Sir Lawrence Friedman, Emeritus Professor of War Studies, King's College London, and our very own Jim Thompson, who is a member of the Board of Directors of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council Town Hall. Jim is also professor of the Party Rand, a Party Rand graduate and president emeritus of the Rand Corporation. Welcome both to both of you. We are so excited about today's program. Well, let me welcome uh, to start off, let me welcome uh, Sir Lawrence Friedman to Los Angeles virtually. Um, he, he, Lori's been in Los Angeles in, in the flesh many, many times in the past and, and many times in visiting the Rand Corporation. But, um, but to introduce him, he's the, I guess, Professor Emeritus now of War Studies at King's College London. He was at King's College for most of his career. And for part of that time, he was the vice principal. So he, he, he it was over 10 years he did that administrative job, which is in addition to the, the job of an academic. So he's not solely an academic, but also a university administrator. I was trying to count up how many books Laurie has written. Uh, I went to Amazon, I found 31 titles. Um, some of them probably smaller than others, but we, we're here today to talk about the latest one, the one called Command, which came out earlier this year, the study of of the, the politics of military operations since World War II. Um, Laurie is also was a member, was the official historian of the, of the Falklands War. And he also served on the, on the commission investigating the, the, the participation of, of the United Kingdom in the Iraq War of 2003. So welcome, Laurie. Um, you know, given all of this, you grew up in, in the Northeast of of, of England, um, I guess your, your, your officially would be called a Geordie. Certainly, and, yeah. Yeah. So how did you get from there to being what now is the people are calling, or in Wikipedia calls the Dean of UK Strategic Studies? Well, that's partly just by uh, staying in the same career for a long time. Um, I got into the area um, by a sort of circuitous route. I mean, I, I, in the 1960s, I was sort of a standard student radical protesting against the Vietnam War. So I wouldn't have imagined uh, I'd have the career I had. I got interested actually first as an undergraduate in the role of experts in policymaking um, and decided I wanted to look at nuclear strategy as an example of that, but it was mainly sort of political process. But I was very fortunate when I went to Oxford to do my PhD uh, to be uh, supervised by somebody you'll remember, Sir Michael Howard, uh, who really was the, the Dean of, of British Strategic Studies, the founder of, of War Studies Department uh, and, and a great figure. And he became my mentor. Uh, and I sort of recall when I, um, almost the moment when I when I read uh, when I discovered he was going to be my supervisor and I read a, a book of his essays called Studies in War and Peace that sort of moment I, said, I want to do this I just mm -hmm. and it, what it did was move me away from thinking about policy making processes to the actual substance about the, the, the challenges of war and peace um, and how could it, one could approach this intellectually um, rather than, uh, if you like, on the streets or, 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 or in a polemic. Um, and so that's when I was sort of set on my course. Mm 
Yeah, you like, well, actually like, like uh, my career, you, you didn't serve in the military and no. you, but you, but you served, I had the same thing. I, I, I got into this after doing a, a, a short career in physics and I started getting into the into, into defense policy analysis. And have you found it to be a, a disadvantage to, to do this without having served in the, in the army or the, or the military? Not really. I mean, my father was a, a regular naval officer during the war and a bit after. Um, and I obviously, uh, that doesn't sort of give me any qualifications, but I talked to him a lot about it. And um, because I started off on the nuclear issue, um, I think that was, that was of, all the, of all the various uh, areas of war studies, that was the one where uh, an actual military expertise didn't give you any particular advantage of the famous quip, you know, how many nuclear wars have you fought, General? Um, <laughs> a, 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 civili a, a civilian uh, could come into that. I think the, a key moment for me came at the start of the Falklands campaign in, in April 1982, oddly, almost exactly coincidental with the start of my tenure at King's College. Um, when I realized that if this had been a nuclear war, I'd have been in my element and could have explained every aspect of it. But as a conventional war, I knew absolutely nothing about really about what was going on. And at that point, I made it my business to, to try to get a, a better understanding. And I was very fortunate that a number of those who'd fought in that war um, were happy to talk and became friends. And um, I learned a lot from them. So I was always a willing student. Um, uh, and also, you know, mainly I've been a historian of these things. So um, uh, as a historian, you, you you can get into it. And to be frank, I, I've always felt myself stronger when I've been looking at the policy making and why and the strategy. Um, I'm not the sort of military historian who's very good on battles. I think for, for which you probably do need to have had some proper experience of your own to really understand what's going on. Well, let's now turn to the book. I mean, we're here to talk about the book Command. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I can't hold it up because uh, the interference is called, caused by this background I've got. So I, maybe you've got one to hold up, but in any case, okay. I think the World Affairs Council has given a, a link to be able to order the book if people are interested. This is a really a look at the at the relationship between the political authorities and the senior military commanders, and the senior senior military commanders and their subordinates during crises or conflict since World War II, and uh, it shows you know it shows a lot of interesting in, in these. I think I wrote down I think there are fourteen different cases that are studied. Um, in my time in dealing with the military, I spent, which is a lot, and I've met a lot of senior officers and, in my career, and I frequently encountered the view that the, that the political authorities should tell the military what they want and get out of the way, maybe giving them some rules of engagement in the, in, as additional guidance. But this seems to have come from the experience of the Vietnam War, where there was a view that there was too much micromanagement when Washington, in your book, in fact, you demonstrate that's true. There was a lot of, you had President of the United States deciding on airstrikes and the details of airstrikes. So, so um, maybe you could give us a couple of examples from the book about the way in which these kinds of relations between military leadership and uh, maybe one, maybe an example where there was too much guidance and then one where there was too little or maybe there wasn't maybe it wasn't too much for guidance maybe it was guidance that was needed wasn't too much yeah I, I mean I mean the basic point of the book is is that sort of relationship um and the belief somehow that the the, the politicians can decide on objectives without actually having a pretty good idea about what their military options are uh it, it's it's an argument for dialogue for 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 a regular conversation between the top uh, political and military leadership because it's unreasonable to expect politicians to come up with objectives if they turn out to be unfeasible and it's also unreasonable for them to uh, be able to ignore how these are being um, being the, the, their objectives are being met because the cost of doing so may be um, uh, unrealistic 
So, I mean, there's, there's a number of examples uh, of um, where this relationship was challenged. Um, I mean, one example is the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, not because actually there were enormous differences uh, in implementation. I look particularly at the blockade, uh, or quarantine as it was called, uh, and how the US Navy went about it. Um, they probably didn't disagree particularly with what their political masters wanted. They just objected to the, the idea that, 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 that they would be told what to do. There's a famous encounter um, between the chief of naval operations, Anderson, and, um, and Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, um, which, which basically ends, you know, we've been doing this since Paul Rivera, we know what to do. Um, so, although actually in practice, uh, when you looked at it, they, they, uh, they, the Navy were acting responsibly. I think during the crisis, President Kennedy's main uh, alarm was with the views of the Joint Chiefs as a collective, particularly Curtis LeMay, who were really quite cross with him for not taking the chance to take out Castro when he had the chance. Um, and that was certainly exceeding their military uh, advice. Now, I mean, an example of a sort of rank and subordination, which interested me, because I don't just look at American or British case studies, is Ariel Sharon in, in Israel, who was one of the um, more gifted uh, generals of, of his generation, uh, capable of quite audacious and bold plans, who um, never believed that anybody above him had a clue what was going on. Uh, at the start of the 1967 war, almost advocated a military coup because he was annoyed that the government wasn't getting on with mounting an attack uh, against Egypt while it had the chance, and fell out with almost everybody uh, during the course of the 1973 war. Um, when we have the odd situation of a divisional commander who has come back uh, as a reservist, as a politician, he'd left the army to, to found the Likud party, to be one of the founders of the Likud party. So he saw his division as a labor division, as a Likud division, uh, and the, the other division in Southern Command as being a labor division. Um, and that, as you can imagine, didn't lead for a, a lot of healthy coordination. What interests me about Sharon is that when he became Minister of Defense and was not subjected to superiors who in the end gave him latitude where he needed it, but came down on him where he had to be put in his place. Um, where he was in command, he led the Israel into a terrible war in, in, in the Lebanon um, because he didn't have um, that uh, those voices above him asking whether he was acting wisely or not. So a lot depends on, on personalities uh, and structures, um, but the healthy relationship is one where the politicians don't feel afraid to question the advice they're getting from the military, uh, and the military says, aren't afraid to offer advice to the politicians. Very interesting. What, now let's turn to the to the ongoing war in Ukraine, and and you know from the standpoint of your book, I'd be interested in your thinking about the different styles, and and of leadership of military of, of command from between Ukraine and Russia, and which, what, what are the advantages, disadvantages? Are they, how important are they in the war? Yeah, I, I mean, there turned out to be very striking differences. I think it, it, it's, uh, it's a bit fortuitous in some ways because I think the, uh, the command that Zelensky took over was still quite Soviet in its attitude, but he changed it a bit and, and you've got, uh, I think it turned out to be a very intelligent group of, uh, of generals running the war. And Zelensky has seen his role as being supportive and, and concentrating on what he needs to do, which is encouraging his international supporters to keep up with their support. So he's had quite a, a clear idea of his role. Um, but he also has the advantage of being a sort of attractive, eloquent figure. Uh, who knows how to talk to Western audiences and puts enormous effort into doing so, but is also prepared to go to the front line and talk to troops and so on. Um, but it's quite a Western 
model that, that, that he's now following and um, obviously very influenced by the United States and to a degree the United Kingdom as well because they've been in there advising really since 2014. Putin by contrast is sort of classic autocrat um, in that uh, his decision making is pretty opaque, um, he doesn't get out and about, uh, he, he delivers long speeches which are hard to follow, uh, changes his mind on um on what the objectives are and how it should be pursued is a procrastinator um and uh so key decisions he, he with the weather military being pressing him he's delayed them for example on mobilization um but the the surprising thing is how unprofessional the military have been under him um only one can argue since September has there been an effective command structure um, with, with, with sort of realistic objectives. But to start with, the command was, was pretty chaotic with different chaotics, with, sorry, with different um, commanders running different axes of the war, um, with, with their communications not working properly, with uh, officers not... It, not having explained what they were doing effectively, the logistic systems breaking down. So it, it's a pretty unimpressive performance and not what people had been led to expect if they read Russian military literature, which was all full of how they'd sorted out their problems of the, the past. What now what's going on at me a little lower level than the in the in the command structure is is hum how much our flexibility to lower to, to lower level of commander, commanders have i mean you know you cover in the book the concept of mission command where you know you give the you give the orders what what they're supposed to do in case they lose communication or anything happens if people have the ability to, to make an adjustment if they want to we're describing here like the american army the british army mm -hmm. And maybe the Ukrainian army. I don't know if that's true or not. But and and, that, and is that different from the Russians? Yeah, I think almost by by necessity. Um, I think they have been encouraged to develop sort of uh, NCO structure like the U.S. and the U.K. armies have, which really makes the army work by having uh, the, the people who make sure the weapons are properly maintained and the tactics are understood. And morale is looked after and uh, and so on but i think they had to delegate a lot of initiative simply because of the way they had to fight against the russians which is small groups um uh, having to work in some ways on their own at least to start with the russians seem to have followed a very hierarchical system they don't have an nco structure they don't uh or not very well developed uh, there's not a lot of room for local initiative. So you get lots of stories um, of uh, having failed the first time to achieve an objective. They just go back the same way um, with the same result time and time again. So there's been a number of instances um, that, have, that have been quite widely reported where there's been quite catastrophic consequences by just not allowing local officers to, to work out what needs to be done and uh, adjust their tactics accordingly. So it has been pretty inflexible. And one of the striking features of the Russian campaign is actually when you look back at it, especially after they sort of retreated from around Kyiv at the end of March, has been how much effort has been expended actually on a very few cities, which they've hammered away at until They've taken Mariupol to start with, then Severodonetsk and, uh, and now Bakhmut. Uh, and even if they eventually take it, the the um, the cost of doing so for what is now a bit of rubble is, is extraordinary. So um, there's a there's a remarkable lack of strategic imagination, I think, and and tactical flexibility on the Russian side. It's improved as one would expect during the war, but the problem that we've now got is is that uh, there's now so many of their troops uh, poorly trained, part poorly kitted out, that even if the, the, the commanders there with a bit of better grasp of what to do, they don't have a military instrument that, that is um, able to respond well to 
uh, demanding orders. Very good. It, it was, <clears throat> I've got, my, my turning back to another one of your books, I've got a lot of your books, uh, not all 31, I will say, though, if I don't have my yeah. but a lot. But one I have is one of your earliest books, which you've updated several times, which is, I think we get the name here, Evolution of Nuclear Strategy. And I, I think I told somebody recently that this is the Bible on nuclear deterrence. So now we're in, we have a war going, we have a one, one of the two powers is armed with nuclear weapons. And so we have a case of deterrence is happening right before our eyes. Now, the way I see things is, to make it simple, is that we are deterred from taking actions to help the Ukrainians in ways that we think would provoke a nuclear response by the Russians. A good example is we won't give the Ukrainians the ATACMS missile that they could, they could use with the HIMARS launching system and which, go, which would take them quite a bit, quite deep into Russian territory if they decided to strike that way. On the other hand, the Russians have not used nuclear weapons and they're, they're deterred apparently from doing so by fearing how the world would react to that, as well as wondering what we would do as a result. How do you see the situation? Well, pretty well as you just, much as you describe it. I, th I think the idea that nuclear weapons uh, haven't been used in this conflict is quite misleading. They're, they're, they're absolutely essential to Russian strategy, uh, which has been from day one to threaten uh, a potential cat catastrophe should NATO get directly involved. And we saw this at first with the idea of a no-fly zone, which the Ukrainians were asking and, and, and which was refused on the grounds that this could involve um, NATO, particularly US aircraft, uh, shooting down Russian air aircraft. So that it's been important from day one in that sense, and it's been important in the other direction. I mean, why, you know, whatever some the, the sort of lurid threats you sometimes see on Russian state media, there's been no uh, strikes against Poland or Estonia or um, Slovakia or any, you know, the, the, any of the other countries supporting Ukraine on the front. So in that sense, uh, nuclear deterrence has worked as one would expect it to work. Now, if there keeps on being speculation about uh, escalation by Russia, you know, but the fact is they've managed to escalate pretty um, terribly without having to resort to nuclear weapons. So they've still managed to take out a lot of Ukrainian um, uh, electricity and water supply and so on. And um, they've done that with conventional weapons and, and, and decent intelligence on the networks that they're attacking. And frankly, probably more effectively than if they'd used nuclears, which would have got a response. And I think the response would not be nuclear, it would be conventional. And all the things that they're trying to deter the West from doing, probably the West would do, including get much more directly engaged with conventional forces. Okay, very good. So um, you've also been writing with your son, Sam, what uh, some of our audience may not know what these are, a sub stack, which you, which is something on the internet, <clears throat> named Comet is Freed, where the, the last Freed is spelled the way your Freedman part of your name is, 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 is spelled. Uh, I'm a subscriber to that. So I'm just, I've mentioned this, maybe some other people here who are in this virtual room want to, want to subscribe. If they do, it's Sam F at the dot substack dot com. So thank you. But I want to ask you about one of these articles, which was about the effect of the war on the politics in the Kremlin. Mm. And in the article, which you wrote a couple of months ago, you argued that Russians Russia's losing the war. And I think that remains the case. That was written before the fall of Kherson. Uh, and and uh, but leaders who who lose wars, lose their positions, yet as a broad generalization. So, so but Putin seems to be, have coup-proofed himself. He's, 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 uh, he's, he seems to have a you know, perfectly strong position. What do you think is gonna be the politics in the Kremlin as this thing unfolds, if it continues in the way it is, sort of a slow, but, 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 uh, but damaging uh, Russian loss? Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, and I've written a bit more on that theme, but it, it, it's um, because I think it's it's desperately concerning, and to for those of us who would uh, 
like this war, or, or most people would like this war to be concluded, um, yet, uh, uh, and can't see how Russia can win. I don't think there's any obvious path to victory now for the simple reason that the Ukrainians aren't going to accept any sort of Russian subjugation, nor are people going to force them into uh, giving up a, a large chunk of their territory. So even if it leads into some sort of military stalemate, the, the, the Ukrainians aren't going to give up. I think the problem is, is, as you indicate, that Putin can't agree a peace deal, which in effect acknowledges defeat by requiring his forces to withdraw. Um, and because he can't acknowledge defeat and, and the sort of the reckoning that comes with the defeat, it suits him to keep it going one way or the other for as long as he can. Now, I think there, there are reasons why, despite that, it may still, um, there, there may still be some movement in the Kremlin, mainly because I find it hard to see how the Russian military can keep this going indefinitely, given that they have other tasks that they're supposed to perform, and they're going to find reconstitution extremely difficult. Um, uh, because they've lost, what, six, seven years worth of defence production with an economy that is uh, is going down. It, it, it sustained itself through oil prices and so on, but, but that, that's already starting to be less of a, less of a factor. Um, and I think also if the Ukrainians do get in a position where they can seriously threaten Crimea, that also may, may prove to be an incentive. But for the moment, uh, I, I think it, it, it's uh, precisely because Putin is aware that when the war ends, there's a reckoning, um, that, that he's pretty anxious to keep it going. This is why I think there was this sort of major shift in Russian strategy in September, when uh, first he sort of doubled down on objectives by annexing four uh, provinces in addition to Crimea, even though he was in the process of losing control of um, of a couple of them. Um, and secondly, uh, the mobilization, which is a major burden on the Russian economy and society. Yeah. For, I think, I mean, some, I mean, you can't say there's no military advantage when you're able to find 300,000 extra people to fight, but but they're not most of them aren't at all trained and they've got terrible kit and are suffering in the winter and so on. Uh, and there's much more deliberate attack on Ukrainian infrastructure. So this is all reflected a sense that from September, early September, that things were going very badly. And rather than try to find a sort of some sort of way out of the of the of the of the conflict, uh, instead he he escalated in yeah. in ways um, that have made it more more deadly for everybody, uh, but don't actually bring Russia any closer to a victory. Yeah, right. Because you you can't take you cannot take ground with air power or missiles. So um, I, I want to one other before I turn to our audience. I think that one other thing that I wanted to ask you was about winter. You wrote the, mm -hmm. you wrote an interesting article on the Substack about winter. You detailed the, the effects of winter on on the military operations, personnel and equipment, and so forth. And I, the last week, I participated in a in a in a converse, a discussion group about about the war, and you know, with a lot, a lot of people, I think were specialists. But one of the people in this conversation said something very interesting. He had lived in Ukraine for in the '90s for about uh, several years, and he said he said there's an old Ukrainian story. There are no bad winters. There's just bad clothing. And that make brings me to the. To thinking about the, the difference in, in, in the equipment for winter operations between what the Russians have now and what the Ukrainians have now. I don't, I don't have much detail about that, but maybe you do, and maybe you have some, some observations. Yeah I, yeah, I think the idea that the war would stop for the winter was always wrong. Um, it's, it certainly slowed it down uh, because of very muddy conditions at the moment. That's, that's a problem. Also, you don't have the same sort of cover you get where, when the trees have lost their leaves. Um, but uh, the Ukrainians have made it pretty clear that they're, you know, that they're not stopping. And, and as things freeze over, uh, they assume they're going to move. And um, 
clothing is is obviously just general winter kit um, because you know there's a, there's a problem in winter with badly maintained kit um, that, that it's, it's going to break more easily uh, malfunction uh, but if you have decent kit uh, and a big effort has been put in to provide Ukraine with with good winter kit then it makes a difference meanwhile we're getting some kind of awful stories about um, hypothermia and um, trench foot and, and, and just generally poor conscripts being dumped in in awful conditions which are impossible to cope with now again you know it varies not the, the, the Russian not all Russian soldiers lack winter kit um by any means and, and, and many can keep on fighting um but it's um it's a problem I think for, for Russia uh and um given that temperatures are still going down it, it's going to be quite interesting to see uh how well this how this plays out in, in the next couple of months okay well very good i think we i have an obligation well i got one more i guess i can ask one one more question before we get to the the, the audience we we've started we've covered partly this already the, the 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 fact that the russians have now transitioned to the an air war with missiles mainly with missiles they seem to be not uh, using their aircraft so much uh, and attacking with some effectiveness, electric power, other kinds of logistics and, and infrastructure. Um, you know, this also brings this brings back out always the old question of air war and the effects of air war on the war. And I, I, I the late Harold Brown was a trustee of Rand, and I knew him quite well. And he had been secretary of the Air Force during Vietnam. And his he said, I every time there would be a question of air war, he would say. There's one lesson I learned, bombing doesn't work. And so uh, what's your view of how this will likely affect the outcome or, or at least the, the continued conduct of the war? Um, it's made life miserable for Ukrainians. Um, uh, it's not gonna, I mean, bombing doesn't work as a means of forcing governments into capitulation. Um, yeah, that was his idea. Yeah, it, uh, because, People can adjust um, uh, with difficulty, but they can adjust. Um, and anyway, you need a sort of political movement in which you know, there's sort of rioting in the streets, demanding an end uh, to stop the to stop the the bombs raining down. And that, well, that's clearly not what's happening. Um, bombing, I mean, you know, bombing can force refugees to flee, and the Russians use bombing quite successfully in Syria, you know, against civilians. So. They do have experience of it being effective, but it was in a very different situation. I think the big gap, though, that, that surprised people is that though Russian aircraft have been busy, the way you would expect, the way the Americans would expect to use air power in a war like this is uh, in, in combat air support, to, to, to support the, uh, the frontline troops by um, taking out opposition in front of them. Uh, and this hasn't happened. Uh, it has happened, but, but not anything like as much as we expected. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian Air Force is still operating. Now, I mean, this is quite surprising. Um, and it's a testament to Ukrainian air defences. Um, uh, and possibly a complacency that developed in the Russian uh, pilots in Syria, um, who just weren't prepared uh, to face a serious uh, serious opposition. Um, clearly, against missiles uh, and drones, it's a demand on Ukrainian uh, air defences, which is why uh, I hope the stories about Patriot going there are true. Um, and one of the problems is that the more air defence is needed to protect uh, Ukrainian cities and infrastructure, the less it's available to support the frontline troops. So there is a trade-off there, which is why they need as much air defense as they can get at the moment. But in general, um, I mean, I, I think what we have seen so far reinforces what Harold Brown said to you, which is that you can do terrible things uh, to human societies, but actually you don't break them that easily. Um, and, and in fact, what you do is make them pretty angry uh, and determined to carry on with the fight. Right. 
Well, I guess we can now turn to the questions from, the, from our, our audience. Uh, Rachel's been collecting those. So Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you both so much for being here and for this great conversation and to our audience for submitting so many amazing questions. So I want to start with this question, which is, can you compare Russia's command structure today with the command structure of the Red Army in World War II? Um, well, yes, it's sort of similar uh, in that it's very hierarchical. But of course, the, the strategic challenge faced by the Red Army uh, against the Nazis, which is an industrial, which is a war force of enormous scale, an unimaginable scale compared with the, the with this war, um, was that it was essentially about moving large numbers of people into a fight uh, with not a lot of care taken about losses. Um, that attitude is sadly still there. So you still have the the, the strong hierarchy. You still have um, actually sub subordination to the political echelon, the military. Uh, it, it's a system, as in the Soviet system, where they expect their orders to come from the civilians. They don't. They don't make it up themselves. Um, but but it's the scale that makes makes everything different, uh, and the scale, uh, and you know, not very far away from where the current battles. Uh, are being fought was the Battle of Kursk, which was sort of the biggest tank battle ever, um, with thousands of tanks involved. So it's, it, that, that's what makes a difference, where you, where you can't leave quite so much to individual initiative, even if you wanted to. So our next audience member asked, what are your thoughts about possible successors to Putin and the consequences of such a transition? Well, it would be nice to have there to be a, a successor to Putin. Um, it's, it's not immediately obvious who this is. Um, there's a number of names that are not knocking around. Um, and, you know, there, there are alternatives where Putin hangs around, but with diminished power, uh, you know, it's quite hard to see how there'd be a, a coup of some sort. So, um, and of course, one has to recognize that most of the opposition and criticism of Putin hasn't come from sort of technocratic moderate types because they're either sort of busy trying to keep, make the system work or else have left or, or have been imprisoned or um, or killed or whatever. So the opposition has come from nationalists, from hard, quite hardline nationalists. And it's as least as likely that a replacement for Putin would be um, a hardliner as somebody who'd be looking for an accommodation. Now, that may make no difference because you, anybody... Um, with any sort of leadership qualities would have to take account of the situation in which they found themselves. So they might still, and they might find it easier to agree a peace that, that, that a, a moderate who'd be worried about uh, being criticized by the hardliners. Um, but but I think we have to, to, to keep that in mind. I think it's just also just, we just have to think of some of the issues of reparations and war crimes that are going to have to be addressed. Um, this is going to be a very sort of bitter and resentful Russia for some time to come. Uh, and its ability to come to terms with what it's done to Ukraine, I think, uh, is, is going to be limited. In the same vein, what US or Western policies or actions would you recommend over and above from what is currently being used, including supplies provided, et cetera, in order to bring about a more rapid and successful conclusion for Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, you know, first thing, by and large, I think the West has handled this pretty well. I mean, compared with past crises, Jim and I have seen um, that th th this has not been too bad. And, and it's been quite uh, incremental in a way, and, and then the Ukrainians wished it, it would have gone faster. But gradually, one line after another has been passed as it became apparent that Russian uh, strategy was, was as brutal as it is, and that Russia, having failed initially, was, was doubling down and carrying on, which I think has required um, a strong response from, uh, from the West. Uh, so I think, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's any way that we're going to get involved directly, and I wouldn't particularly recommend that. But I think some of the inhibitions 
uh, on the range of weapons and on um, on air power, I, I, I would look to, to ease. I think there's ways of making clear to the Ukrainians um, the terms under which these can be used. And, and in practice, even if the Ukrainians want to, I mean, the Ukrainians have had some uh, attacks on, on, on Russian territory using homemade drones, amongst other things. Um, but these are limited. And you know, there's no way that Ukraine is going to be in a position to do to Russia what Russia has done to Ukraine. But there are potentially relevant targets um, that could make a, a difference to the military effort. And it wouldn't do any harm for the Russians to realize that these are coming into risk. So uh, I, I, would, I would have fewer inhibitions on the use of arms. The main priority, however, is, is pretty clear, and I don't think this is contentious more air defences, and just more ammunition for, for, the, for the, what you've already sent, uh, because uh, these wars are incredibly intensive in their, in, in their use of uh, ammunition. That's actually a great segue to our next question, which is, are we now past the age of the tank? Has modern missile technology made armour too vulnerable? Well, the, 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 the death of the tank is, is regularly announced. I, I, one of the first wars I ever watched closely was in 73 with the October War, um, which, which had enormous tank battles with numerous tank casualties. But the, of course, the, the biggest threat to a tank uh, was another tank. Uh, and actually, there's some videos I saw posted today in which Ukrainian tanks were taking out Russian tanks. Um, so uh, the fact is, if you want mobility on a battlefield with firepower, and some protection what, that can go over a variety of bits of terrain, you end up with something looking like a tank. Um, but I think the lesson is more that um, it, it, when, when you lose cover, when, you can, when your position can be accurately found, you're very vulnerable. I think that's, that's a lesson. Um, and so uh, we're still trying to come to terms with the full implications of, of precision guidance, um, which when it was first introduced, the systems were few and far between, but now they're quite plentiful. That makes a difference. Drones makes a difference because it's easier to put at risk an unmanned system than a manned system. And they can go to places where uh, you wouldn't put a helicopter or an aircraft, um, and they can be used in swarms as well. So there's, there's all sorts of new technologies coming in, but they tend to be layered rather than replace what's gone before. Um, and, you know, in this war, in ways that, you know, the Second World War commanders, even First World War commanders would recognize has been an artillery war. Um, our, our artillery is still um, the, the, the most important weapon on the battlefield. Thank you. So shifting gears back to Russia for a minute, is a Russian military collapse possible? And what circumstances are most likely to produce a collapse? Well, they've already had one um, in, um, in Kharkiv, um, which was sort of an old fashioned rout where um, they weren't prepared for the, uh, for the Ukrainian assault. And when it came, they basically ran. In, in Kherson, they, they, they managed more effective withdrawals. Um, mil I mean, mi military collapses do happen um, normally because um, position just seems hopeless. Uh, I think you've got a very dispersed battlefield in in Ukraine. Um, it's, it's a very long uh, front line, so you don't tend to have very large concentrations of troops which of the sort that, that might lead to sort of mass action of, sort of, of panic of, of some sort. Uh, I think what you're seeing much more is of small units giving up, um, trying to get home, uh, in some cases deserting, in other cases just trying to keep their heads down. I think that uh, um, seems to me, from what I, I've been able to follow, more of a response. Um, the question, I think, for the uh, the Russian military is if that happens 
too much and the Ukrainians are able to find spaces um, to move behind Russian lines, um, particularly in Luhansk, I think, maybe Zaporizhia, um, then they're going to be in trouble. And uh, that is when the, the, they're going to think if, if we don't withdraw our people, that then um, then they're going to get into a, into a mess and, and you may well see routes. So um, I think one of the things we have seen is that the Russian military are not bad at working out when they're losing and when their position is, is, uh, is not good. They'd normally wanted to evacuate places before Putin had allowed them to do so. Um, and so that's my main source of optimism, I think, is that if they know the position is hopeless, um, I don't think they're going to pretend otherwise. Uh, and there's quite a lot of Russian military bloggers who are often very nationalistic and uh, pretty uh, horrific in their attitudes towards Ukraine, are actually militarily pretty objective uh, about what's going on. Our next audience member asked, why doesn't the UN or a similar international org or even the UK and US as the world's tops, top weapons dealers provide a way for innocent people who have become collateral damage to submit claims for war damages? The audience member also noted that General Petraeus did this in Iraq, but that was out of war discretion, not international legal policy. Well, the issue of reparations and war crimes is going to be big issues. I mean, the Ukrainians are, are charting everything and, and, uh, and, and the claims that are going to be made are, are, are very large indeed. How you watch, I mean, this is on Russia, so how, how you persuade Russia to cough up on all of this is uh, a very different question uh, about which I'm moment not very optimistic um but there's you know the, there are ways um for example a lot of which are being explored for example a lot of uh, Russian funds have been seized um uh and there's a question of whether they could be turned over by as forms of reparation so that there are things that are being explored but it's a very difficult issue it's not an issue of morality it's clear where the morality comes in, but it is an issue of practicality. Thank you. Looking forward to an end to the war in Ukraine, how would you structure Western policies post this war so as to avoid the issues of the Treaty of Versailles, which is offsided as setting the stage to World War II? Well, it's, in a way, it'd be quite good if we could get to a Treaty of Versailles, because at least they were addressing the issues. I think it's going to be quite difficult to, to get to the point where there's going to be a serious peace settlement. And of course, you know, reparations immediately makes people think about Versailles and the burden that was imposed on Germany and the resentment that was caused uh, and so on. Um, so it's tricky. I mean, there are trade-offs. If we ever actually get to the point of a, of a proper peace treaty, uh, but we're, we're a long way away from that and I, i'm not wholly convinced we'll ever actually get there we may just end up with a ceasefire and disengagement agreement um sort of like korea if you like which you know 70 years on we still haven't had a peace treaty so um but i think we have to be aware of that there, there are also when you, you had president macron you know sort of saying that we have to think about security guarantees to russia which is an odd comment um the way things are because the issue is going to be security guarantees to Ukraine um, for the future. I also think we just have to keep in mind that leaving aside issues of reparations, the big question is going to be how Ukraine is able to reconstruct. My major fear is that we'll do what we've done in, in the past, which is if Russian forces have withdrawn, believe that we've now done the job, uh, whereas there's a massive job to be done in helping Ukraine put itself together again. And that's going to take time and money to do so. Shifting gears a little bit, this audience member asked, has satellite technology made a surprise attack unrealistic? How have commanders adjusted to satellites when comparing satellite surveillance, surveillance today with Ultra in World War II? Well, very different. I mean, Ultra, um, I mean, Ultra was obviously a, a massive breakthrough in intelligence. It wasn't real time. I mean, it took a while to, to get the, um, the messages and decrypt them uh, 
pass on what had been learnt and so on, and it was patchy. Um, satellite surveillance is not always perfect by any means. The weather can make a difference. People learn how to hide. Um, but intelligence has played an enormous role, and, and you know, in the, the Ukrainians don't have their own satellites, so you can work out where they get a lot of their intelligence from, um, and it's helped very much with the targeting. So it, it does make a difference. It's an interesting question about surprise attack because, you know, this war was watched as it developed. I mean, everybody, we all knew how many troops and what they were up to and how prepared they were for operations and so on, because it was all recorded in the American and British governments both released intelligence saying that the Russian attack was imminent. People were still caught by surprise uh, because in the end, the actual decision to attack is still a political decision, and the decision to prepare for an attack is still a political decision. Um, so you can, even when you know it's coming, you can still feel a surprise when it happens. Um, but it's all much more transparent than it used to be. Uh, and and um, uh, so I think we, not just sort of the intelligence, but the communications, which also facilitated by satellites, are extraordinary compared I mean, in my book I look at lots of a number of cases earlier on in my period where it, um, it was just like the second world war it took a you relied on the telegraph and, and the telephone um, but you didn't have anything like the instant communications that we now have um, uh, and the, and the uh, everybody looking at the same screen and seeing the same things all of this is really quite transformational in in ways probably a younger generation just takes for granted, but, but by way of comparison for the past is remarkable. Thank you. Another big question, why do so many wars persist and limiting war continues to fail even when it was technically outlawed by the Kellogg Brand Pack in 1928? Well, uh, it's, sadly, um, well, you know, there's a very basic problem, which is the, cl the classic problem of, of war, which is we have an anarchic system and no international government. And, and the UN was set up to address that issue. Um, and unfortunately, it gave a veto to the five permanent members, one of which is Russia, uh, so that... Uh, you can't get a permanent member to stop a war. Of course, also one of the consequences of the Calabrian Pact, um, which outlawed war, was that people called their military operations something else. <laughs> they, they didn't declare war anymore. It used to be the case that wars were declared, uh, and this was the, considered the proper legal thing to do. Now, after the Calabrian Pact, they just didn't declare them. They just happened. And they did in 1939, but... <laughs> excuse me, by and large, wars when you just called them something else. So I'm feared it's, it's quite hard to outlaw violence. It, 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 it happens. Great, thank you. So our final question as we get close to the end of the hour, how susceptible <laughs> is a weakened Russia to a dissolution of its territory or to Georgia and other former Soviet republics trying to reclaim their territory? There's two questions there. Um, I think it's quite plausible that if Russia fails in Ukraine in a very evident and um, calamitous way, that other um, countries that have seen some of their territory occupied, uh, Georgia, Moldova being the obvious example, might try and do something about it. Um, There'll be quite a lot of pressure on them to do so, especially Moldova, I would have thought, with Transnistria. Um, I'm not, I mean, I think first we have to be very careful about talking about the breakup of, of the Russian Federation. It could happen. Um, I mean, the, the Russia has uh, used troops from uh, outlying districts, uh, not, not as few as possible from Moscow and St. Petersburg, um, often from ethnic minorities and so on. And this is building up resentment uh, that, that, that could uh, explode in some ways. But I, a lot of people who know Russia Federation quite well 
are, are skeptical of this anyway it's not up to us i mean and it would produce its own instabilities and uh, and risks so it's possible uh just because of you know what once you start wars like this you set in motion events that you can't control but i don't think um I don't think it'd be particularly helpful if it happened, and I don't. And it, and um, uh, it's not an, it's not something that we can uh, influence much ourselves. Nor should we be trying. That would be something that probably would get the Russians even more on edge than they are. Well, thank you both again so much for being here today. And Jim, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks to the audience for those great questions. Um, I wanted to I wanted to give my own answers, but we're here for to hear Sir Lawrence Friedman. So we want to thank Sir Lawrence, or as I know him, Lori, for this great hour. And um, I guess we have another one tomorrow. Another, by the way, if there's one tomorrow when, with another Jordy, but I'll let uh, I'll let that uh, turn that now back to Kim. Thank you both for just a superb conversation. And we love that you beamed in from London, Lori. <laughs> that was such a treat for us. Jim, well done on all levels. And we learned so much from your experience and knowledge in this complicated environment. So thank you so much for your expertise and your time. And as Jim said, we've got a lot of fun things coming up. You can check out our website at lawacth.org. We have Fiona Hill and a lot of other great live streams between now and then at the end of the year and some great in-person and live streams lining up for 2023. So go to our website, register now, make a donation, become a member. We love that you're all part of this community. Mm -hmm.